Good evening. My name is Harry Helling. I'm the Executive Director of the Birch Aquarium at Scripps. It's my great pleasure to introduce our speaker tonight, Dr. Dimitri Dehane. Dimitri is a Scripps marine biologist developing research in the field of biomimicry, which is the process of emulating nature to support green and sustainable innovations for various industries. His research aims at understanding the fundamental mechanisms responsible for specific adaptation organisms have developed to thrive under particular conditions in aquatic and terrestrial environments. The findings can then be used for biotechnological, biomedical, and or bioengineering applications, thus addressing societal needs through biomimicry, or also called bioinspiration. Inherently, his research covers <clears throat> a broad range of topics including UV protection, bioadhesion and bio anti-biofouling, biophotonics and biomaterials with unusual combination of properties. His research also relates to living light, the production of light through bioluminescence or fluorescence, as well as through structural color co coloration and iridescence. Dimitri's research is at the intersection of material science and bioengineering, making his expertise cross-disciplinary and bridging the gap between academia and industry for which he founded BEST, which is the Biomimicry for Emerging Science and Technology. Dimitri earned his PhD on fundamental and applied aspects of bioluminescence in 1998 from the Free Thinking University of Brussels in Belgium. In 1999, he moved to Scripps, where he is now an associate research scientist. He is the author or co-author of almost 100 peer-reviewed publications and is one of a new generation of innov innovators and entrepreneurs at Scripps. Please join me in welcoming Dimitri for his talk entitled, Biomimicry, Innovating Using Nature's Toolbox. Well, um, good evening. I don't see any of you, but it uh, feels a little bit awkward. So I, I need to hear you instead. So uh, first, thank you, uh, Harry and uh, Cheryl and uh, the Birch Aquarium and Bank of America to uh, welcome me and organizing this, uh, this talk. Um, so I was, taught, uh, I was thought that um, it's interesting for you to know a little bit about me. Um, I was born and raised in Africa. and. Um, I think that has shaped who I am. It has shaped me because at that time, um, no TV, no radios, no games, no iPads, but we had nature, nature to look at, nature to observe, to keep observing. And so since I was a kid, I always looked at nature, trying to understand, how do they do that? Why can't we do it, right? And so I think because of that, my research now has evolved into, uh, into this field of biomimicry. As it was mentioned, um, I've been at Scripps since uh, 20 years. So I'm pretty new at Scripps, <laughs> based on, <clears throat> I have 40 years to go. Um, so, uh, but uh, it has been a very great story to put together the research because Scripps is such a unique environment where we can work together with uh, UCSD, the medical school and engineering school. So today, I will tell you about biomimicry. I will tell you about what it is, and we'll browse to some examples of what the most famous biomimicry examples are, and of course, talk about some of the research that I have. So let's start from the beginning. The beginning is this. Nothing. <laughs> right? This is who we are when we start life. And then what do we do? This. <laughs> That's not me, just so that you know. Then we go to this. Do you guys can already guess what I'm going there? What do we do? We go there. And then further there. I like this dog, it's amazing. <laughs> we basically copy. And biomimicry is innovation inspired by nature, which basically means we copy nature, right? And so biomimicry is very important in copying nature. It's a word that has been already out there for, you know, since the 50s, but became something very fundamental to um, the layperson as well as companies. For the last 20 or 30 years now, biomimicry has become 
some sort of a business, a, a, a way of thinking that has impressed many universities and many businesses that have adopted the word biomimicry in their way of doing R&D, for example. And so biomimicry is this uh, approach of innovation. So biomimicry seems to be a little bit of an awkward word, and you might have heard it under the name of bioinspiration. Bioinspiration really means how can we look at nature, be inspired by nature, but maybe not only mimic it, but use what nature has done for something, but maybe apply it for something else. And so we'll uh, go through some examples of that. And so my talk will jump around and uh, provide you with some examples of biomimicry. Why is biomimicry so attractive and so important? It is the shape of a shell where it goes through discoveries and exploration and then creation of what we can emulate from nature. Of course, it's very important because it covers academia, where I am, but we work intimately with industry, where maybe some of you are. So if we don't work together yet, please contact me afterwards. <laughs> so this intersect between academia and industry has always struck me that in this country and all over the world, people believe that there should be avenues that don't interact. And that's not true. The industry and academia have to work together, and biomimicry is a great way to do it. Some examples. What is the most important example of biomimicry? Something that you have been exposed to as a child. Velcro. Velcro is the first example of biomimicry, from where you were wearing your diapers to, well, we all did, but uh, to uh, the Velcro on your shoes. This comes from the discovery of a person going to walk his dog, and the dog, as well as the person, will come with those seeds attached to it, to their skin or their pants. And say, like, how do those seeds work? Why can we imagine or invent something that will actually stick the same way? And here came Velcro. The same way the screen technology has evolved considering that the eyes of insects are not just one single eye that, like you and I have, but are multifaceted structures that help with discovering and with eliminating some of the uh, pixelation process that we have using our current technology. What I want you to see from this slide is mostly the time it takes from the discovery to the application. For the time of the Velcro, it was maybe you know, five, eight years. But look at some other discoveries. It goes 15, 20 years. And that's the whole hologram of industry and academia. In industry, it's clear that we want an answer within a year or two. In academia, we have time, right? Especially here at Scripps. Yeah, <laughs> who will not take his time, right? And so that's the big difference. But also having time allows you to have this uh, um, intuition for exploring and for look at options. And so when we go to some more recent research, you probably have learned about you know, some of those uh, insects that collect water. We'll talk about that, some of the skin. So biomimicry is there and you might not be aware of it, but it is actually all around you. It is all around you because intimately behind whatever you can imagine, we try to emulate what nature does. So we have uh, emulation on trying to copy what nature does because copy, copying nature is like addressing what is in nature as a catalog of products. We can look at what's in nature and believe it or not, but people will be like, oh, this inspires me to do something or something else or invent something. And so if you can take, think about it in terms of materials, communication network, how do a thousand ants communicate to one another when sometimes in a room of five, we can even communicate amongst each other? How do ants do that? How come we can do it? So there's a lot, of, a lot to learn from nature. And of course, there are some inspiration from buildings and other things like that. So let's go through some examples. This is a um, slide that 
browse a bunch of different things that, you know, uh, if you don't, I mean, you could use a trump of an elephant to give the apple to your kids or, you know, it's a little bit of awkward application. But everything that goes from bats to dolphins and sonars, we didn't invent sonar. Nature did. We just copied it. The same way the shape of a bird comes from, you know, it's not from the planes that we build. We build the plane based on the shape of the birds. Of course, there is a next generation of um, pangolin-inspired cars that will resolve all the parking issues that we have here on La Jolla Shores. <laughs> And so that would be great. And of course, there is the, uh, there is the, uh, the, the, the Velcro. One of the latest technologies, of course, the, uh, the nanotechnology inspired from the gecko pads. So that's very key because you see you can now climb a, a window. And so in the future, which will be very important for here for the uh, aquarium, so when we go and look at the, uh, at, the, at the big tank there, you don't have to be sitting with the others. You can actually climb the aquarium and look at the sharks there. So be your Spider-Man of, uh, of the birch aquarium. <laughs> and so these are applications that are more or less important, you know, depending on where you stand. So the other example that is important is true applications. Um, in Japan, uh, they developed this very high-speed um, train, which was great because it was going fast, but which was very annoying because every time the train would go through a tunnel, it would make a big blast because of the, uh, the sound waves that would not uh, propagate well, that would basically have a hard transition between the tunnel and the open air. And so the Japanese engineers got inspired from um, the bird, the, uh, the kingfisher bird, and trying to see how does this bird can penetrate the water without generating any break in the, um, in the, in the water, any waves. And they designed the shape of the train the same way the beak of the bird is. And now there is no more impact of sound for the neighborhoods. So this is an application that is very uh, one of the most uh, intriguing uh, engineering application. Of course, I mentioned the birds and how we learn to fly. Um, the case of the train was an application based on convenience for uh, the people living next to the train. Uh, curiosity has also pushed for this application of building these fascinating objects, which we call planes. Planes are inspired from, from birds. And as you know, there is a long history and a lot of people that have tried to, to fly with more or less success, and now with a lot of success, uh, gladly to hear so. And so we can now basically um, uh, travel the world and have this, uh, this world that belongs to all of us. There is still improvement to make. There are still planes that can be more efficient, planes that can now even just start to flap their wings so that we can learn more about uh, how uh, birds that land on, on, the, on the water can, uh, can do that. Another example is this one, which is a fascinating one. You hate mosquitoes, I'm sure, right? We all do, not only because of their sound, but because they sting you, and you only feel it after the fact, right? And so now there is a company that develops a new kind of needles so that they can use a needle on you, you won't even feel it, which is great, so that all this aspect of the trypanophobia <laughs> will be gone. So no one here will be, able, will be claiming to be able to, see the, to go to the doctor and hide under the table there. But uh, this was appropriate, I think, for uh, the time of the year we are in. And so uh, this kind of application can be revolutionary uh, just for the aspect of the medical field, but also for, um, for the, the engineering, as I said earlier. In terms of energy, we have whales that are gigantic. They are so big, but yet they are able to do spirals and swim as if they were ballerina dancers. And so how do they do that? Well, they do that thanks to those little um, structures that they have on their fins that helps them uh, develop the best possible um, flow in the water. And now this is being used uh, in industry for harvesting uh, currents and, uh, and, and, and winds. More closer to us is the uh, shark-led technology. 
uh, if you pay attention to sharks, if you are a shark lover, lover or shark hater, it doesn't matter, but sharks are always clean. There is nothing really growing on them. There is no barnacles like you can see on whales. There is no algae like you can see on other organisms. And so how do sharks clean themselves except, except from the, uh, the, the, the little fish that are around them? The thing with sharks is that they have a skin that has a nanostructure, a nanostructure pattern that basically push away any kind of biofilm to grow on them. And so these nanostructures now are basically almost what you have on, on your cell phone. And then you can see that the patterns that you have on your cell phone are designed so that you don't have biofilm and anything grows that will grow on them. And now we are thinking about this company, Sharklet, uh, developing um, everything in a hospital based on these nano patterns and nano designs so that we can keep away the bacteria from uh, giving the um, the, uh, the, the big problems that we have, which are infections related to just being in the hospital. Surfaces are, are important. In animals, they are. And when you are stuck on the ground like a plant, it's even more important to play with surfaces. So this plant is a plant that obviously secretes something that attracts ants. And uh, that plant can have the surfaces dry, as it is here. And you see the, it attracts the ants. The ants make their little trail. And as you know, if one ant goes somewhere, then a gazillion number of other ants will follow. right? And that's the main issue. So the plan is smart. It's like, let them come dry, make their trail. And then somehow, it makes this surface more wet. And look at those ants. They can barely stand there and choop, 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 choop. And this plant is eating them. It's a feast. Now, how does that work? Um, those surfaces are called slips. And they are now have been described by a team in uh, MIT and Harvard. And they are used so that they can actually uh, have liquids run on them very, very fast. Those slips can go from a dry state where things stick to them or don't actually roll to a wet state where you can then make things very, very slippery. So no more issue with your ketchup bottle where you can put ketchup all over the place. Now your ketchup will slightly nice and you know, go through the bottle. But more importantly, we can just maybe with less friction um, bring oil across the country. And maybe it has a power to play a role in biofouling. So those are the kind of applications that are interesting uh, to learn from this, uh, from this plant. Other applications are more local. We are in California. We are a desert, very arid climate. And uh, if you live close to the coast, you might feel like it's very often the winter because you can barely see 10 feet ahead of you because it's foggy. Every morning you wake up, your water is covered with water. So even though you, we are living in a very dry state, there is water around us. There is water in the fog. And so if you walk around and you see those torrid pine trees who have lived here forever, torrid pine trees don't go under one in the morning, unless you want to take a shower. But basically, they collect water so efficiently that as you can see here in the parking lot, there is water all around the tree. So what happens? So we work together with a, a team of, uh, of a few a few um, lab members. Emily is a high school student from the Cambridge School. She's local here. Uh, as I said, biomimicry is great to bring people from uh, different avenues and different expertise. Uh, Nan is a biomimicry professional. And then I have a postdoc, uh, Bill. And then uh, Yvonne is an artist. And together, we try to work on making and un understanding how does this tree make water from the fog. And so Emily started this uh, at home. She has won uh, a, a series of, um, of uh, science fairs, uh, national as well as international ones. So she's very, very proud of her. And then we also uh, de defended this at the Trinet competition in, uh, in, in 2015. This is key because this is the basic fundamental understanding on how do organisms, in this case a tree, collect water in a place where we need water, right? And so the first step was to um, create fog. 
And so we are very, very fancy engineers, so we buy a, a humidifier. It works, you know? And then uh, we make fog, and the, the thing it works is that we take those needles and we try to, uh, to image the fog in there with using this camera. And so this, this is a simple, very simple way to do it. There is one problem. Have you tried to image water when it's only one drop at a time? It's not easy, right? And so what we did is that, of course, we added a dye to the water so the water looks blue, which um, the consequence is that we all look blue after working in the lab for a few days. And so as you can see here, the, the, everything had to be contained in a chamber. Everything became blue. We all looked like smurfed after the day. But anyway, it looked good. And so we make fog, and then we try to quantify the fog. And then uh, we use a camera that is f uh, focused on the needle, as you can see on the movie up there. Uh, the f it's fogging everywhere. The fog looks white, but it's actually blue. And then we can look at uh, the processes that are related to, um, to the formation of the water at the surface of the pine needle. What happens is that I'm, I'm sure no one has ever really looked at a pine needle collecting water. So this is a, a snapshot or a close up of what it looks like. The pine needle looks green. I think everyone knows that, right? But when you look close to it, it's not that green. It's actually green and white. And you can see the white edges there. And then water is blue. And over time, within 20 minutes, you see that you have drops of water appearing between the white structures. And it becomes more and more important. Follow the green, ar the green arrows. And you see that at the end, the water, uh, it's uh, filling up the green space between the white, and then will eventually run down. What we realize is that a pine needle is actually a very complex material made of an alternative, uh, alternative sequence of materials between hydrophilic, likes water, and hydrophobic, doesn't like water. And so what it, the way it works is that the, um, the water will nucleate or will start to form on the green part, which is where it likes to be. And it will nucleate and start to accumulate. And when it makes a big drop, the white part is pushing that away because they, uh, we don't like water. And that's great, because that means that when one drop is formed, it is pushed away from where it is, and the site is open again for nucleation and for collecting more water. So the process is has no limit in time and can go on forever to the point where then you have a parking lot filled up with water at the bottom of the, uh, of the tree. So this is a perfect example of self-watering. You don't, need, I mean, if you have a Torrey Pines in your home, don't water it. You do it by himself, you know? He went through a good school for that. He went through a school of evolution. And so um, this is a great example that we can learn from that. If a tree can do it, why can't we? So we look at the structure. And then this is a, a, uh, an example of uh, a film example where in, in, that has been accelerated. And you can see the water on the side. Um, as I said earlier, it is difficult to image the nucleation of water because water is transparent. But something on top of it is that imaging water that nucleates in the fog, as you can see the fog here, it's not easy either. And so, we have to come up with, uh, with different ways to image things on the side, to only bring the fog in one direction, et cetera, et cetera. But at the end, we are able to, um, to recreate the condensation process to understand where the water gets nucleated. And of course, now what's next? Let's make it. Let's 3D print materials so that we can now start to make surfaces that can collect water, especially here when you're in, in uh, along the coast in California. I'm sure that if we were able to generate our own water from the fog that comes to us every morning, we'll be much better off than, um, you know, uh, we always need water, and, we'll, and water will be, uh, will be a, a, something we'll, uh, we'll need in the future. All right, let's move on now from another material. This was inspired from the fact that uh, if you walk around the um, the tide pools, you might sometimes see some fish swimming here and there. And those fish, some of them are called cling fish. And cling from clinging, they like to grab on something. 
and they like to stick to whatever their habitat is. It can be a rock, it can be an algae, it can be another animal. And so that clean fish is interesting because it lives in an area where you have strong waves usually, and where that clean fish has to hang on to it. But it doesn't have anything else but a suction cup-like kind of uh, organism, or organelle on its belly. And so when you look at this clean fish, and then you think of the mornings where your razor or your soap and your shower tub falls because the suction cup doesn't hold. It's like, how can a fish have such a very amazing, super performing suction cup? And we can't. We can make one. Can we improve it? When we look at the fish, it is amazing because this is a dead fish. No animal mistreated here. This is a totally <laughs> dead fish. What's amazing is that that fish really sticks to even big rocks. And so that fish uh, has a potential for us to learn about developing something that can be applied to many different things. You look at the fish, we can analyze the pads, we call that, the, the structures that make the suction cup. We designed their shape, we looked at the ratio, we looked at all the little nitty gritty biological structures that are there. And we can identify what they are to the point where now we have mimicked that, 3D printed a suction cup that can work on any kind of surfaces. We can take rocks, we have taken oranges, we have taken anything you can imagine, it sticks to it. So no more issues when you are in your bathtub about something falling, now we have the solution. So this just got published and we have, a, uh, I think, a press release coming out about this um, in this week, actually. This is in collaboration with the engineering department at UCSD. What's interesting about this application is that aside from applying this suction cup to pick up very delicate fruits or vegetables, for example, it can, of course, be used for exploration. When you are a driver of an ROV that is about 5,000 pounds and that you need to have a grab of metal of 500 pound grip, but you need to take a delicate plate in a um, boat or ship at a 2,000 meters deep, it's not easy it's just not to break that plate. And uh, the student who worked on this, Jessica Sandoval, is also an ROV diver and got very frustrated by the fact that she could not grab the most delicate artifacts when you are diving with an ROV. So that grip can hold that suction cup. And now we can actually even take an egg that is there at the bottom without breaking it. We tried also with the grape itself, but we are making omelets for the entire crew there. <laughs> but now you can actually grab that egg, spin it around, and make sure that we can grab it and then bring it back down without breaking it. So now we have the opportunity to push exploration to the deep environment and collect things that are very fragile, independent on what their surface is. Could be round, it could be slippery, it could be spiky, it doesn't matter, it works. Now, if you're a marine biologist, that's great, but what else can we use this suction cup for? So, we, I don't know if you all had dinner, but you know, <laughs> so close your eyes if you have not had dinner. But um, applications in surgery is incredible, because of course, if you are going through surgery, you need to move organs around. And what they do now is they use grips, not the 500 pounds grip like in the ROV, but you need to have those grips and move tissues around. You can poke those tissues, you can make holes in those tissues. We don't want that. And so now we are using, we did a, an experiment in the, uh, with uh, UCSD, as you can see on the movie there, the traditional way of using you know, pinchers that can basically damage your tissue. We did not the experiment, can we be as efficient in that experiment or in that surgery using suction cups? And the answer is yes. The answer is that we can now use suction cups to move organs around without 
stressing them that we know of, but at least without having this very hard grip on them and without taking the risk of um, you know, making a hole in the tissues. So we believe that this uh, technology uh, will, be, uh, will be successful in being applied in a variety of fields from um, deep sea exploration and other kind of exploration to anything that basically needs a surface of any kind to be, uh, to, to be uh, hold on. And, and you know, using those, uh, those, those, uh, those suction cups are a, a very good example. Um, we did that with bowel move, the bowels as well, which is uh, very critical because the bowel is actually extremely thin and very, uh, very delicate. And so being able to do that there was also a very good uh, stage of uh, passing the uh, criteria that surgeons will have to, uh, to apply this technology in the, uh, in, the, in the medical field. As you can tell, most people ask me, okay, well, it's great, it stuck to everything, but how do you de-stuck it, right? <laughs> well, it works fast, it's easy. You actually slide it, slide it sideways and it actually unstuck itself, and so it's very, uh, it's very easy to, uh, to manipulate that. More of the bowels, are you good? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so, let's move on. So my lab, in addition to all this fancy uh, engineering, what we do also is color, right? We look at color and light, which is fascinating. And color is important because it defines us. We are already trained to react to red light and green light even before we know how to drive. You are two months old and you know that red is bad and green is okay, right? And then you forget, but <laughs> bad drivers. But color is very, very important. It defines whether you want to blend in or you want to stick out of the environment. Do you want people to look at you then wear a lot of very big you know, lipstick, red, 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 and if you don't want people to look at you, just be settled and have a different color. Animals do exactly the same thing. And we are animals, so we do that as well. And so, Understanding how animals make color can be very interesting, not only because of what we want to be and how we want to be dressed, but also because we are conditioned by color. We're conditioned by sensors that we want to know through your pregnancy, pregnancy test. It's only a color that appears. So colors is really everywhere into uh, the sensing world. And so we study that, and we study that so that we can develop colors that are dynamic and that can also resist to degradation. And so because we study color and because it's so pervasive in nature, my lab does not work on one single species. For example, we work on many things. Uh, seeds, tarantulas, uh, we have scorpions now, uh, we have brittle stars, fish, and cuttlefish. So we have this diversity of organisms that help us understand how does X, Y, and Z make color that we can learn from and then develop uh, our own way of making color? So we'll go through some of these examples today. This is a snail. Snail, Hinea brasiliana, very high tech. Um, as you can tell, it's not transparent. Um, as you would guess, it would come from Brazil because of the name, but it does not come from Brazil. It comes from Australia. I think that at that time they had a little misunderstanding on how the world was positioning. <laughs> but what's important is that the snail, uh, we thought was behaving like any other snail that is luminescent, which is basically just one other species. The other species that is known produces light from the foot. And the foot, as you know, if you poke a snail, the foot will retract under the shell. Don't tell me you have not done that. I'm sure everyone has done that 100 times. And the snail will always hide under a shell. And so if this is the case with a luminescent snail, as you poke the animal, it will retract under the shell. And under the shell, you won't see the light anymore because it's under the shell. And so that's her hypothesis. And of course, you take the snail, you put it in a chamber that is called a luminometer. It measures light. And you see the uh, colored lines there, the, 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 the red, uh, green, and, uh, and, and blue, are the snails that produce flashes of light. And the black line is the background. 
And so we're like, okay, super, we have, we have snails that produce flashes of light. And what about now if we put a starving crab in that chamber that will go after the snail, and that crab will probably touch their soft tissue, and the snail will, we imagine, go under the shell, and what we should see is nothing, right? The lights that are colored here should go closer to the um, black line. And nature is amazing because what we observe is the contrary. So what do we have here? We have a Superman snail, or what's going on? What's going on is that in that particular species, the light is not produced by the foot. It's produced by one particular area on the back of the snail that is always under the shell. Doesn't have to go out. That's because the shell itself, it's a very good diffuser of light. And so you can shine a little beam of light through the shell, whoop, the entire shell lights up. Very efficient, because that means that when you get punched by a crab, you don't only produce a little area of light, your entire shell glows, which you know very well that the bigger the signal, the scarier that signal should be. And crabs actually back off. Very well designed. That shell is made to diffuse light as much as possible in all directions. It is about 10 times more efficient than any light diffusing material currently available on the market. 10 times. So even engineers are amazed by this. And this is a shell made of calcium, not plastic. It's important. And so how does it work? If you look carefully at how that shell is made, it's a series of nice little fibers nano-optical fibers that are surrounded with a little bit of protein to make it exactly like the fiber optic that you use at home to have your internet. Exactly the same thing in a much smaller scale. It's super well organized. It is made of enamel, which is the same material that your teeth, and yet is able to conduct light. Now we are trying to build this to make it artificially so that we can have a very hard material that would be as hard as your teeth as enamel, which is one of the hardest materials that we have, non-toxic, non-plastic, so that we can use it maybe for technologies where we use light and we want light to be dispersed. One of them being, for example, solar panels. Solar panels have this very big problem that sometimes light hits only in one area of the panel, which is the one area that burns the fastest. And unfortunately, when you burn one area of the solar panel, most of the time you have to replace the entire panel which of course come with cost, et cetera, et cetera. So having something homogeneous would be nice, and so we are trying to understand whether or not this technology could be applied for such application. I cannot speak about light or color without mentioning birds. If you are like me and have walked around and find a bird feather when you were a kid, you picked it up, you might have put it in a closet somewhere, in a drawer, and if you still have it, take a look at it tonight, it is still of the same color of when you collected it 10, 15, 50 years ago. The color has not changed. Very different from the t-shirts that you wear every day that basically fade after a year, right? So how can nature make permanent color? And the way it is made, is because color in that case is not due to a pigment like we use, but is made is make through a structure. Feathers are fantastic. They have this array of different uh, colors that they can play with, from white to black to green and all the in-betweens. The way the color is made is through these little beads that are black there. And those beads are organized in such a way that they make an array of structures called nanophotonic structures. So that the light hits them, and because of the repeat motif that they have, a physical mechanism split the light of different colors. So white light is made of RGB, red, green, blue, right? And depending on the spacing and the um, refractive index, so the, the density of this material, and the, the, uh, between the material and what's around it, it will split different colors 
more or less homogeneously. And because of that, you can shine white light and you will only have a particular coming back at you. This is very common in nature. Uh, the structural coloration has one particular property that you might have seen is that it changes slightly with the angle of incidence. So when you see a bird or a duck that is in the water that moves a little bit and you might see the color on the neck going from black to blue or from green to, to uh, blue, that's exactly the structure that I'm talking about. These structures are amazing. We don't understand well how they are made now. But you can look at them from different color of the feathers. They have different structures. Of course, the black have to absorb. So they're a mix of different shapes and different, uh, totally disorganized, no, no particular organization. But as I said, because the color is driven by the difference of density or refractive index between those black melanosomes, those little beads, and what's around them, if you're able to change what's around them with something else, it changes the color. And so if you take your uh, feather that you have at home and uh, put some vodka on it, don't waste it too much, <laughs> but <coughs> put some vodka on it, you will see that the feather will change color. And as the vodka evaporates, it will come back to its original color. So alcohol is a very great tool to see this dynamic coloration system. In this particular case, we were able to change the color from green to uh, purple or red or fuchsia using different types of alcohol that we use in the lab. So feathers are amazing in the sense that they can make colors. They have also other properties involving thermoregulation and so forth that I'm not addressing here. Uh, we always want to be like birds, maybe. We want to try to mimic what birds do. So we uh, are part of this uh, uh, great funding opportunity uh, through a, a MURI. And so we are trying not to make colors using melanin, those little black, be black beads. And so you see the British commercial PDA there is polydopamine. It's a chemical. It's not that we grinded the bird into a black. Uh, <laughs> just want to make, make sure understand that again for people lover, uh, animal lovers. So we, we get inspired by the bird. Uh, we don't grind it, but we buy the chemical. And the chemical is black. And depending on some of uh, uh, association that we make, we can make that chemical go into beads. And that bead will be almost like what you find in the squid melanin. But now if you organize those beads into different layers, depending on the spacing of, between the beads and the number of, of beads in the layer, you can make these uh, fascinating rainbows of colors that can basically change if you change the, 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 the nature of the environment around, each, uh, around the beads. And so now we can make coatings that are basically dynamic coloration that are technically eternal because melanin it's, it's, not a physical it's not a chemical process. This is a physical process of making color. So we're not making a, uh, a paint that uses a dye anymore, but we are making a color that uses a physical process uh, instead of a chemical process. So that's a, a very good inspiration that is getting materialized now from, from birds. Um, aside from birds, spiders also make color. And what's interesting is that birds, they have big feathers. You can make big surfaces. The big issue that we have in making colors is how can you be very small and making a lot of different colors? As I said for the birds, if you want to make different colors, you have to make different structures. You have to, make, you have to change the refractive index, or you have to change the spacing between the beads. What's interesting about this little tiny spider, very, very small, that tiny spider is able to make all kinds of colors. It's the smallest rainbow known in nature, the smallest one. And that's because it's very smart. As you can see from the spider down below, as it changes the direction, you will see that the black becomes iridescent purple and goes through some green and yellows. It's amazing. The way it does that is that it has on its back small scales. Yes, spiders have scales. And those scales have ridges on them. And those ridges are positioned in a way that, depending on the angle of incidence of the light reaching them, they will make different colors. 
this is a very small way that nature has come up to use the very tiny structure to make all kinds of colors from the rainbow without changing the structure, but just by changing the angle at which the structure is exposed to the incident light. That's why as the spider changes its positioning, it will be looking at, it will show different colors. It's just by changing how these uh, angles of the li those little bumps are facing the incident light. This is now currently technology uh, used by NASA and GPL so that they can develop new materials that can be used in space because, of course, in space you cannot just bring a big surface inspired from a bird. We'd rather use a very small surface inspired from a spider. So that's the uh, kind of uh, application that we have. Okay, uh, this is the last stretch here. And the last stretch comes to um, conclusion about a bigger picture on architecture. We are talking about this uh, re revitalization process of the Birch Aquarium, for example, building communities that are more integrated with the environment. Now, the, from the old days, old indigenous cultures, which by the way, it's Columbus Day, so happy indigenous culture to uh, everyone, but this is a perfect day for it. Indigenous cultures have been inspired to build homes from nature. Look at nests of birds. Those nests have inspired the teepee, the teepee to be built and uh, other uh, ways to make housing. Now, we can be more sophisticated than that. And nowadays, you have very fancy projects that have cultural connotations. You go to Asia, where the lotus flower is very uh, um, important for the culture. Buildings have the shape of the lotus, which is great, but it's inspired from there. We also have these uh, fantastic buildings that look like a, a, a spaceship uh, coming out of uh, you know, London here. And this is inspired from, um, from the glass sponge, which is uh, a way to uh, circulate light and make the light space extremely homogeneous inside, inside the building. What can we learn from it? The other uh, building that we learn is that it really depends on where you want to put your mindset. This is the people that are skeptical about biomimicry. Uh, people that talk about the opera house in Sydney will look at barnacles. Some other will look at broken plates. And so it's all really a matter of what you want to see like and how you want to pr promote the inspiration to the audience that you speak to. This architect has a very, very different idea. I didn't see barnacles like I do. He actually saw the art coming from peeling an orange and how those little peels will fall apart from the center of the building. And so the interpretation is very different. But I'm a marine biologist, so I will stick to the barnacles. And I think that this inspiration is very clear. This um, opera house has had a lot of success, um, not only because of its design, but its uh, integrity and how it represents this rocky shore in, in Australia. If you go snorkel in tropical oceans, you will see those coral reefs that are magnificent, different shapes, different colors, and most importantly, a gazillion number of animals living together. We cannot, as human beings, do that. How can a gazillion number of fish live together in a tiny reef? The same with termites. How can termites, gazillion of them, live together, all together in this one termite mound? And we can't. How can they regulate the space? How can they regulate the airflow, the temperature? And we can learn from that. From the termite mounds, for example, it is clear that on the design here, you have structures that are made, that are inspired, that inspired some architects, so that we can develop buildings that naturally will cool down in a hot weather depending on what you have and how you favor the different airflow within the building, the sideways will come the 
cold airflow and the center will bring the hot and you will have a convection, convection process. This is what nature does, taking advantage of the physical processes so that we can, they can use it for the best advantage. Now, what have we done with it? Not much in the US, I guess, but go to Zimbabwe where it's hot, where electricity is expensive. And if you can have something passive that allows you to stay cool just by building the correct way with the correct structures. This building now is self-temperature regulated, doesn't need AC, and everyone sleeps in it comfortably without having to deal with the heat from the outside, exactly like termites do. There are other ways to look at it. People have studied it very carefully. Uh, people have studied how salamanders, which breathe through their skin, can help design walls and help design space so that if your brain overheats too much over there, you can see all the hot steam from your brain as you think in a business office. All that goes into the hot, uh, elevated atmosphere. How can we recycle that and make that go out and bring in some fresh air? So this is really a no-brainer. We can do it. We just have to look at how nature does it and use structures to help us become smarter because it's right there in front of our eyes. Um, people have used that to design buildings. Uh, this is a building in Puerto Rico. Uh, it is designed so that it can resist uh, any further tremors from, uh, from any earthquakes. It has uh, sitting on, on pillars that are um, for earthquake um, resistance, and they have shapes that are low airflow and optimizing the uh, taking advantage of the space. Architects are really uh, getting um, a lot of attention now when they can design a building that blends in much better in their environment. The key, of course, is to use the local materials. Less PVC, more of the local materials, more of the wood, more of the recycled materials, and this helps tremendously with the design to develop um, materials and, and, and buildings that are uh, more, um, more sustainable in the environment. So as a summary, what is biomimicry? Biomimicry is around life. Species that have evolved to live somewhere, like we do. It's about being all dependent of each other not independent on each other. We have to live with each other, not only as a human species, but as a species, an animal species. We need to make sure that we can use resources in a very efficient way. Why wasting? We need to make sure that we are using chemistries that are sustainable, that are less toxic that are inspired from nature? Why making something from scratch using engineering when nature cannot absorb it, nature cannot degrade it? That leads us to environmental problems where we are. And then we have to also act locally. We are here in San Diego, try to deal with what's common here in San Diego use the materials locally, use the resources locally. I know that you want to have, you know, maybe a, your cheese from France. I do too. But <laughs> now that we have tariffs, we have an excuse not to use them anymore. But try to use things locally. And with that, I think that we as a human species can definitely have a much lesser impact of, on the environment and live much better in synergy with our environment. I thank you for your attention.